Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's roundtable, and I want to thank uh, uh, the uh, people who are in person and those who are logging on. I'm happy to have uh, Senators Lujan and Mullen, and I know Vice Chair Murkowski is, is um, looking forward to this session as well. Uh, there is a real opportunity here to discuss the implementation of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. I want to go over a few uh, housekeeping matters. Uh, if you are participating remotely, members will be able to see you on WebEx and call on you accordingly. Just be sure to raise your hand so I can recognize you and make sure you're on the monitor for everyone to see. I also ask that you remain on mute until you're recognized. I encourage all panelists, both in person and online, to raise your hand to be recognized if you'd like to add a comment or respond, even if the question wasn't for you. Finally, please identify yourself as you start to speak so that our court reporter can accurately pick up who is speaking for the record. And now I'd like to introduce and welcome our panelists. I'll start with our panelist from Hawaii, Sean Kanai Aupuni, President and Chief Executive Officer of Partners in Development Foundation. Aloha and welcome. Uh, and um, we also have um, uh, with us today the Honorable Timothy Navangyoma. Mm, I'm not sure I got that right. Did I get that right? Good, all right. Uh, the chairman of the Hopi tribe in Arizona, here in person, we have the Honorable Sherry Parker, the chairwoman of the Hualapai tribe in Arizona, and Ms. Susan Mastin, the acting executive director of the Native American Finance Officers Association, um, and um, the Honorable Jared Michael Erickson, the chairman of the Colville Business Council, Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation, uh, in, uh, in, in Washington State, a little easier to, to pronounce. Um, uh, turning to today's discussion, last Congress we passed two big bills making historic investments to bolster our nation's infrastructure and support climate solutions, electrification funding, clean energy tax credits, community relocation assistance, and dedicated resilience grants are just some of the many resources, including these landmark laws. During the drafting process, this committee listened to Native communities and worked hard to meaningfully address their concerns and needs. It's been over a year since both laws have passed, and it is time to do some oversight on implementation. Um, the, the administration is uh, doing a good job so far, but there is a lot to be done. A number of the bipartisan infrastructure law and IRA programs are in full effect with awards and money flowing. Others are still in planning and decision-making stages at the agency level. Today, no matter what stage we are in, we want to make sure that the implementation is progressing and meeting the needs of Native communities. So if there are uncertainties or challenges, we want to hear about them. I'm particularly interested in learning how it's going in three areas. The incentives to develop clean energy in Indian country, particularly direct pay, uh, BIL's Indian Water Settlement Funding, and IRA's Climate Adaptation and Grid Resiliency Programs. Uh, and. Um, I think uh, I will write, uh, as we wait for um, Senator Murkowski, uh, does uh, Senator Mullen or Senator uh, Lujan have any uh, opening remarks? If not, I'm looking at my staff for direction because she's further away. Are you needing to kill physically. time is what, what you're No, saying? I don't. I just, okay. I'm looking at my staff to make sure I'm doing this right. And I'm, be, I'm sort of intentionally being a little informal because I want us to have a back and forth and not just have five minute speeches alternating. Um, but I will... Um, start with um, Mr. Kanai Aupuni. Um, the IRA directed $25 million towards Native Hawaiian climate adaptation and resilience activities. Can you speak to how Native Hawaiian organizations are uniquely positioned and best suited to carry out the climate resiliency work? Yes. Aloha, everyone. Can you see me? I'm not sure. We can hear you, but not see you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Here we go. How's that? Yes, there you are. I'm a different kind of mister. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Sean Kanaiyaupuni. Aloha, I'm from Hawaii. Um, and yeah, thank you for that that uh, question, Senator Schatz. Um, I mean, Native Hawaiian organizations are deeply entrenched in climate resiliency and should be funded because of the, on many, many, on many different reasons, among them being the significant cultural and, and kinship connections that we have to land and sea and, and that these climate change and impacts can threaten our, our connections. And so supporting organizations, funding these organizations helps not only address very significant um, 
crises, you know, to mitigate crisis up, like upcoming and current crises in our places, but also safeguards our traditions and ways of life. So, you know, the bottom line is that people care about the places that they live in, and we've been living in this place for forever. Um, Western technology is still relatively new in, in the environment management space. And when you think about the generations of knowledge that Native Hawaiian organizations bring to the table in maintaining environmental balance and healthy ecosystems, scientists call this traditional ecological knowledge. We call it just what we do. And so there's increasing recognition among the, sci the Western scientific world about how important it is to work with, with organizations like Native Hawaiian organizations and other indigenous organizations in creating greater climate resilience no matter where you go. And particularly in Hawaii, which consists of four out of the five major climate zones and eight out of the 13 subzones. So it's, it's beneficial to work with the NHOs and these climate zones that have been taught, you know, generations of indigenous ways of maintaining balance and utilizing that knowledge that's been collected across generations as the best source of how to combat climate issues in any of these diverse areas. Uh, you know, when you think about the kinds of climate resilience, whether it's working with watersheds, with deep ocean, with reef systems, mountainous areas, volcanoes, fire, which we've had our share of this, this unfortunately past season, um, and wind systems, uh, funding Native Hawaiian organizations to do the work mean, means you achieve a much deeper knowledge of these systems and how, how, how they are all interconnected. Um, and versus, you know, more Western practices of other organizations of studying climate impacts in, in silos uh, in, as singular instances. We've seen that definitely come into play uh, in an important way with the Lahaina fire disasters where um, you know, local community members just basically saw what was needed and they jumped in and they started working immediately without waiting for kind of the bureaucratic machine of funding, which which we need to kick in, but just immediately um, beginning the work to to provide relief and eventually work towards the not only the near term solutions, but the longer term needs as well. That that. That brings me Ms. to. Ms. could you um, yeah. could you turn up your own volume? Um, we're oh. we're having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. Sure. <laughs> and just start over. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> start over from the beginning. There, that's better. That's better. We did get you, but it was just a little bit of a strain. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I'm on auto, all the way high, as high as I can go. So I'll just try to speak more directly to. Is that any better? Yes. Okay. Um, so I was going to say that that long history of stewardship that Native Hawaiian organizations already have um, means that we, that, that they, I'm not a we, they know how to partner with others, other organizations, and they naturally have those relationships built in. And so when you're funding, you're, when you're funding a Native Hawaiian organization in these instances, you're also leveraging the amount of work that they can get done because of who they already know and are already entrenched with. Um, these are some of the many reasons you probably have other topics or other um, speakers that can speak to similar things here on the call, but that sense of trust that you get when you're working with a Native wine organization, I think in funding issues, you can go, you, you get a lot more impact in a much quicker time because of the work that's already been done, the relationships that are already built in, um, and you know, understanding a community that already understands how to prioritize what interventions first, and then what to do next, rather than um, you know others who may not have that kind of first-hand, deeply entrenched knowledge and historical context. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, those are a few comments. I can address any questions or follow up in any way that would be helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Mullen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> and thanks for doing this. And also, I wanted to take the time to thank you for the way you run the committee. Um, you run it in a very bipartisan manner, and, and uh, I, I, do, I do appreciate it. It doesn't go unnoticed. Um, I'd like to take the time to, first of all, wait, welcome uh, Chairman Jacob Keyes, the Indian Affairs Committee. 
Uh, it's also his birthday. I have no idea how old he is, though. I don't know if Chairman want to share that, but we can we can we can all wish you happy birthday. Uh, Mr. Keys grew up in Purcell, Oklahoma, which isn't a very big town. Uh, he served in a leadership at Iowa Tribe for the past two years, first as vice chair and now chairman. He also is an Oklahoma small business owner. Uh, chairman Keys founded Oklahoma's first native-owned brewery. Uh, it's called Sundance Brewery Company in Oklahoma City. Uh, I look forward to hearing uh, more about the direction in which he plans to take advantage of the opportunities for Indian country and the bipartisan infrastructure law. And uh, I thank him for joining us. Also, uh, when he does have time to visit, uh, he's, I'd, I'd sure like to get his opinion on uh, working with the Department of Energy, uh, specifically with the administration of the Grid Resilience uh, Grant Program. Uh, I understand he's, he's had some experience in that, and I think it'd be good for the committee to hear that experience. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very uh, much, uh, Senator Mullen. Did we want to? Did we want to hear from Mr. Keys now? Sure. Yes. sure. Yes. So if he's available. Thank you, Chairman and uh, Senator Mullen. Appreciate you uh, you guys having us, allowing us to speak, and um, we're definitely um, excited about the opportunities that the this grant program and, and you know, the, the things that we could accomplish for our people here. Um, I think that one of the first things I just really wanted to point out is that in section 40001, it begins by highlighting Indian self-determination. And yet the way this process is sort of set up is basically we end up handing this over to an authority um, a bigger corporation, and then we basically Chairman, pay a um, sorry, percent tax. Chairman, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think we're having an audio problem on our side. Can you just get as close as you can to whatever mic you have and talk as loud as you can? Thank you. Okay. Is that Thank you. That sounds better. How's that? Okay, good. Okay, so um, just quickly, I just wanted to, you know, kind of emphasize that in this uh, section 40001, you begin by highlighting Indian self-determination, and then the process is actually set up for us to basically hand these funds over to a corporation or uh, an, an authority, and then we, we end up paying basically what amounts to a 15% tax. And so um, that, I think, is in, up front for us is the big, the big issue. But we, we're excited about the opportunity to use the, these grant funds to make a big difference here in Oklahoma. Everybody knows we're, we're in tornado alley and, um, we even this basically every year, but we've got spring coming up and we'll, we'll deal with a lot of storm damage and power outages and issues that puts a lot of our elders at risk, um, medical facilities at risk. And we just really want the ability to use these funds the way that's best for our people. And, um, with the ways that I think it was probably actually intended to be used. So um, that's kind of our stance on the on the subject and how it's been set up. We don't actually have a tribal utility authority uh, with our tribes, so we would be sort of forced to, to do that and hand these funds over to uh, another authority. Um, but we, we currently at this moment have a huge passion for working with the Department of Energy, um, creating things not just for our people and our tribe, but also the community around us, the rest of the state of Oklahoma. We want to we want to be great Oklahomans as well as um, take care of our tribe and our people. So um, we are experienced with dealing with the Department of Energy has really just sort of begun. And um, I've only been chairman now for a few months, so I don't really quite have the, the experience that um, has been alluded to. But Again, we thank you guys for having us and letting us give our, our two cents on this subject, and we appreciate the opportunity to uh, hear us all out and hear some of these issues like I'm talking about with uh, this particular program. Thank you very much. Senator Lujan. I'll go to Senator Smith. Oh, Senator Smith. Go ahead. This is the most polite committee I've ever seen. <laughs> this is a very, it feels very Minnesotan, I have to say. After you, after you. Um, well. Phone. We're 
Thank you so much, Chair Schatz, for convening this. And it's so wonderful to hear from, um, from our colleagues here about um, implementation of um, um, these really important laws. And I'd like to just start out with a question to anybody, either um, remote or in the room who'd like to answer this. You know, when, about a year ago, I was able to hold a field hearing in Minnesota talking about opportunities in the um, Infrastructure and Jobs Act for tribal nations. And I heard over and over again that it's really complicated and challenging for tribes especially small ones, to figure out how to compete for federal funding. These grant opportunities are sometimes hard to suss out, hard to understand. And of course, we all know that the federal government has an obligation to provide technical assistance and capacity building to tribes as they're applying for these grants. So I'm wondering if anybody um, would like to comment on this, just broadly speaking. Are there examples of um, federal programs here that you, find, that you think are good models or maybe on the other side, um, examples of n not how we should be doing things? And um, are there some specific administrative burdens that you'd like to highlight for us that we could um, take a look at? Anybody want to tackle that? Yes, please. Thank you, uh, Senator Smith, Honorable uh, Senator Smith. Uh, I, I love the question. Uh, I think there's huge opportunity here with uh, once in a lifetime uh, funding that's made available to not only America, but uh, tribal communi communities across the nation, uh, specifically speaking for Hopi, we've had our own challenges in the form of uh, proposals that uh, we've been able to submit. Cost matches are a big hurdle mm -hmm. that we're dealing with right now. We're a coal-impacted community. We're very rural. Um, we're, I would say, disadvantaged uh, to, to a large degree. And uh, some of the funding that we're looking at to bolster and get a solid electrification for the Hopi tribe, which has now about 85% of unelectrified homes out there, um, it is difficult. So when we're looking at uh, a bigger project, like for example, under the Build Back Better Regional Challenge, we were successful in um, getting awarded phase one, which gave us $500,000 to develop a plan and a project. Um, so we moved on from that. We've got a great plan in place. Um, Unfortunately, weren't selected, and it still bothers me because we have a 500 kV line running right across our wow. uh, yeah. reservation. So we downscaled that project, um, and we're thankful for the fact that uh, the cost match was decreased from 50% down to 20%. But what we're looking at and our ask for the funding, even on the downsizing portion of it, was still coming in at $10 million. Mm -hmm. And I have to add to that that our general fund budget um, has reduced down to seventeen thousand dollars for FY 2023, sixteen thousand in FY 2022. NGS was abruptly shut down, which the government has a hand in, um, you know, ownership. And so, when we're talking about a cost match, we're talking roughly about sixty-five percent of our general fund budget. Mm -hmm. So, if we want to create create some kind of stable electrification, we're challenged with making some hard decisions. Do we shut down elderly services? Do we shut down the schools? What has to get impacted by Completely this? And it's, it's a non-starter, really. Yeah. And so there's a lot of these barriers that are still in place, and I could go on with some other examples, but I would uh, you know, just put that on record to answer you know, your question, and hopefully give you a little bit of context to uh, what we're dealing with. But I'm not only here to advocate for Hopi. There's plenty of tribes that are small and don't have that voice here at the table today. So there's a lot of impacted tribes just like us that don't have that financial capability or stability to make these kind of cost matches to take advantage of such a great opportunity that's on the table here for us. And it, um, it, it bothers us, mm -hmm. and just like many other tribes. So thank you for that question. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So as the chairman is out uh, voting, I will take this take this moment to to thank not all not only those of you that are are here present, but those that are online as we're discussing the implementation of this historic uh, law, the, the bipartisan infrastructure law, as well as the Inflation Reduction Act, and and what differences they they make um, in our in our communities. Um, uh, Jasmine, it's. Uh, most appreciative that you are online with us today, and I want to thank you for, for your leadership there at Rural Cap and for participating. Um, we've seen real benefit when, when Rural Cap, when AFN, 
are, are working together. Um, uh, again, we appreciate that there are there are challenges with our structure in Alaska that are perhaps a little bit a little bit different in terms of our our service the model of service delivery. It's unique, and so it's our tribes, our tribal consortia, it's our ANCs. We've got infrastructure barriers that uh, we have. But even before IJA, even before the IRA, the, um, uh, there was significant support for tribal infrastructure and services within ARPA as well as the CARES Act. And, and the question that I would have for you, Jasmine, as we're, we're talking about where we are now is perhaps some of the lessons that were learned from, from ARPA and CARES compliance and, and just the capacity building that, that we saw, and then moving forward, what more needs to be done? Uh, what do our federal agencies need to be doing more, more broadly? And as I'm talking to so many of our tribes, particularly our tribal, our smaller tribes and their tribal administrators, is they're looking for good technical assistance. They're looking for help with things like the audit auditing and the compliance. So can you speak a little bit about what Rural CAP is doing and, and the role that you have played to help facilitate that? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today and for convening this. Um, and of course, my appreciation to Senator Murkowski for her ongoing support and engagement with our tribes. Um, I am representing Rural Alaska Community Action Program, which is a poverty alleviation or economic development nonprofit that serves the state of Alaska. Um, it is my solemn honor to also be here representing our partnership with the Alaska Federation of Natives. Um, I'm always careful to say we are not a tribal organization, but we partner very closely with the 229 federally recognized tribes that um, continue to thrive across the state of Alaska. Uh, it is very complicated to get two people to agree on different moments of opportunity, let alone the incredibly complex and rich government-to-government uh, -government relationships that are required in Alaska. Uh, as the Senator mentioned, in partnership with the Alaska Federation of Natives, we assisted um, within our organization alone about a hundred tribes across the state of Alaska when, for the first time in history, many of our tribal administrators received ARPA and CARES Act funds. Of course, they did not apply for these funds. Um, and for many of our tribal administrators, they had never received a grant before. So many of our challenges experienced in state started with broadband. Many of our communities do not have internet and grant portals require broadband access. Um, item number two was uh, access to things like a physical address. We do not have physical addresses in rural Alaska and SAM.gov, which was the portal required to access compliance and grant reporting for these funds, um, will not let you submit any documentation, even if you can find broadband, if you don't have a physical postal address. Um, so there were several workarounds that we had to develop with 229 tribes, often with tribal administrators who had no grant compliance experience, um, often with tribal administrators that were learning the language and the tools that grant-based organizations or uh, government-funded organizations have known for many decades. Um, that is in no way intended to imply that incredible innovation and development and forward momentum did not come out of these resources, but we quickly understood in partnership with the Alaska Federation of Natives and our tribal leaders that the technology was going to be a problem. The tools to access and continue to utilize these grants and the forward-facing grants coming out of the Infrastructure Investments and the Inflation Reduction Act were going to be complicated because our tribes don't have connective tissue. They often don't have the internet to search for new competitive opportunities. They often don't get alerts about tribal set-asides. Um, and they often don't have the human capacity. In some cases, um, I reached out to a few tribal partners to ask if they had any information they would like for me to transmit today. 
Uh, one tribal administrator shared that she is currently trying to juggle by herself as the sole staff person for this tribe, seven different federal agencies and 12 different grants. And this is a person who we taught to apply to a grant last year. So there is incredible incentive and excitement, and we believe that this is the economic future for many of our tribes in Alaska. But right now, the biggest challenges are access to these grants, access to the tools to utilize these grants, and they're all coming separately. So I, I will summarize my, my final comment by saying, each of these things is a building block, which together we believe will change the economic future for all parts of our state. But our communities don't have city planners. They don't have folks that are taught to look at each piece of these Legos and build something out of it. And because of timelines, because of different barriers to access, um, they are taking this piece by piece and very aware that with that connective tissue and some additional technical assistance and support, they truly could build a new future that they have control over locally. And, and I heard the word self-determination, we're always gonna land on that. So thank you for the opportunity to speak and to represent the many different cultures and peoples of Alaska. So Jasmine, thank you for that. And you, you've really highlighted so many of the challenges, the barriers that we have when you are, when you're uh, small scale, um, uh, you lack capacity. It's usually one or two people within the community that are tasked with these enormous um, uh, challenges. And so I, just very quickly, because um, I want to make sure that our colleagues have an opportunity to also question uh, some of our other witnesses, you've, you've touched on the, the, the reality that so much of this application process um, comes through uh, the ability to access broadband, um, some pretty basic things there, but we're now we're now kind of in this implementation stage, and and tribes are beginning to develop a little bit more of the capacity. We're seeing the grants coming in, whether it's through broadband or or, or through others, um, and now we've got the other side of it. So it's not it's not getting to the grants. It's now I've got the grant, now I've got the funding, but there's there's compliance issues that come with it, and just as challenging as getting the grant was is the auditing and reporting requirements, where again, our smaller tribes simply don't have the multiple staff to do this. Are you worried that we've survived the first hurdle only to be setting ourselves up to another challenge where we're not able to provide to the government what they're seeking for, for the compliance end of these grants? Absolutely, Senator. When we began the work with AFN of supporting our tribes in compliance, I had a conversation with the Department of Treasury and then the Office of the Inspector General who said, if your tribes miss the compliance deadlines that we've extended, they will permanently lose access to future government funding from the federal government. Say, wait, say that again. They will permanently lose access to fu federal funding for grant opportunities? Yes. yes. And that was said with kindness and support, the intention of alerting us to the urgency that we needed to meet our tribal partners in this space and assist them. And as an economic development engine, my heartbreak in that moment was, this is not about ARPA and CARES Act compliance. You will shut every one of these communities off from ever accessing the tools of economic development that are available to start, children in the lower country. Yeah. They want to do better, and it's about connective tissue. Thank you for that. Uh, Senator Lujan. And thank you, Chairman and Vice Chair, for this roundtable as well. <coughs> um, one of the questions that I have, Chairman, um, surrounds a letter that Senator Murkowski and I led to the FCC and to a few other agencies um, surrounding consent to work with tribes upon um, awards, things of that nature. In this specific case, um, a broadband project. And uh, my question to you is, um, is there um, a provider that was awarded work or doing work on Hopi before that, that non-Hopi entity 
uh, received consent from, from Hopi to do that work? There was no consent. <laughs> And one of the concerns that I have in that space, Chairman and, and Vice Chair, as we, we led that letter is a clock starts upon award. And, and, and if, if there's not consent, that, that could unnecessarily delay the project from moving forward, which could jeopardize the funding for the project. And then based on the laws written, there will be a clawback of those funds. Um, and so the, what the letter was advocating is that consent be required before that clock began, before the award is actually given, to require everyone to work together. And so for, for Hopi, for, for the example that I shared, Mr. Chairman, that, that has not happened. No, sir. I appreciate that very much as well. Um, it's one of those areas where fixing these issues larger um, with the bipartisan infrastructure bill, that that, that attention is, is necessary. And Chairwoman Parker, um, yes or no, is it true that the Hullapai Tribe Water Rights Settlement Act was enacted after the bipartisan infrastructure law, making it ineligible for the Indian Water Rights Settlement Completion Fund? And we can't hear you right now, Chairwoman Barker. So while we, we work on that connection, Mr. Chairman, it, it's my understanding, mm -hmm. Chairwoman Parker? So Mr. Chairman, it's my understanding that in fact that water rights settlement does not qualify for the Indian Water Rights Settlement Completion Fund um, because of the timing. And so what I've heard um, from advocates in this particular space is not only should Congress work to fund this tribal settlement, but that we also look at providing that, that fund and that support for future settlements so that we, we would not see them delayed. But I look forward to hearing from Chairwoman Parker as well. Um, and Chairman Nuvangyama, is it true that Hopi's tribe's budget, I think you shared this with Senator Smith, is, is about $16 million? Yeah, yes. And I, I want to highlight this because it's important that we hear it twice. Um, the Department of Energy asked the tribe for a $10 million cost share for an energy program that it planned to apply for? Yes, sir. And so that devastated your budget? It did, yes. And is it true that um, Hopi requested a, a cost share waiver from the Department of Energy? We did, yes, sir. And what did the Department of Energy say? Well... <laughs> If I may, um, we waited for a response from them uh, for about four months. I think it was only until after they found out that I would be part of this roundtable discussion that we got a response last week. And it was a little awkward in how they started out the letter. We are happy to share with you. And then it went on to say that you've been denied. In, well, in Mr. Sense. Chairman, let me explore that a little bit more because I think there's more to that story. So while you were just recently given a response, isn't it true that the response came four months after the application deadline passed, even though you asked for a response from them with a month to go before the deadline? That is correct, sir. You know, picking up the phone and answering questions, working with constituents is, is the, the simplest thing anyone can do. And so I, I'm sorry for that, Mr. Chairman. If no one's apologized to you, I'm sorry. Thank and let's see what we can do to fix that as well uh, with all aspects, not only in the case of infrastructure, but in all policy. Now, Chairman Keyes, um, yes or no, is it true that the Iowa tribe could end up returning its award associated with the Grid Resilience Grant Program to the Department of Energy uh, because they're insisting that the tribe subgrant its award to an eligible utility provider even though the law says a tribe may do so with all of your conversations back and forth with the Department of Energy? Yes, that is true. And will there be any additional negative results from the Iowa tribe if it has to return the grant? Oh, absolutely. So, Mr. Chairman, this is just another area to highlight that embedded in this legislation was uh, the importance of 
tribes working to build these opportunities themselves as well. And when you have the federal agencies requiring that a, a third party has to come in, when the, 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 the wish of the tribe and the actions taken by the council and the leadership is no, we're going to build this, but that's not being allowed. That's an enormous problem. And I certainly hope that we can address that as well. I, again, I can't thank you enough for this round table. This only begins to um, allow me to ask a few questions of the many that, that exist, but every one of these has illustrated many of the problems and challenges that Chairman Schatz and Vice Chair Murkowski want to get on the record so that something can be done to address them. So thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lujan. I'll just add that, I, you know, this is not a policy problem. There's a tenant, and look, I belong in the executive branch in the state government. There's a tendency to kind of say, well, you know, we'd be happy to do this, but, you know, we're, we, let me give you some technical assistance on a new bill to resolve this. This is not that. IIJA and IRA are very clear in their legislative intent to empower tribes. And... I think some of the difficulty is that we are asking agencies that are not accustomed to working with native communities, tribes, native Hawaiians, Alaska native uh, organizations, um, to work with um, uh, uh, native people and native entities. And so they, it's sort of for them square peg round hole, and so what they do is they try to get you to resemble the thing that they're accustomed to. Mm -hmm. That is not what they're supposed to do. And so what I would ask to, for all of the participants and all of the people, you know, from Indian country across the United States that may be tuning in is please just ask our staff to bird dog this. I wish that it were not so that we have to personally follow up on stuff like this because we've expressed, we've made laws here. We've put historic resources behind them. And it is not up to an agency civil servant to withhold resources from tribes or to require you to, in the case of the IRS now, ask some of these tribes to transform themselves into something that corporately they are not currently. And so please come to us with these problems. I understand there's kind of a difficulty when you're interacting with an executive agency. If you go run to the chairman of Indian Affairs, every time there's a difficulty, that can sometimes backfire in your day-to-day -day interactions with the agencies. But we need to know, and I'm asking, because I am getting quite irritated with the fact that President Biden is all in for Indian country and for natives across the country, Native Hawaiians, Alaska Natives, and Indian tribes. The Congress has already expressed its intent with IIJ and IRA and other historic investments. And it is not within the discretion of these agencies to make it difficult. And they are not doing you a favor by dispersing the money that we appropriated and authorized. And so, I, I excuse my rant, but I want everybody to know that on a bipartisan basis, we will bird dog this, and if necessary, we will become troubleshooters of individual situations. I'm sorry to my staff for volunteering us for this purpose, but this seems to be the only way we're going to get this done, is for people to understand that this committee is watching every little move, and that we expect that this law is implemented in the way that we enacted it, and the way that President Biden wants it implemented. Um, Along those lines, Executive Director Mastin, um, the IRA's direct pay provision allows tribes and ANCs to take advantage of tax credits for clean energy projects. Game changer for Native communities, something we all fought for. Um, it seems to me that IRS is making it pretty difficult, and I'd like you to kind of explain what the problem is, uh, Executive Director Mastin. Yes, uh, Chairman Schultz, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity and members. Um, I'm the acting uh, director for NFOA, and NFOA is a national organization committed to growing tribal economies and strengthening tribal uh, finance. Um, yes, uh, past actions are more importantly the past track uh, record of um, 
is that we don't listen to tribes, what their needs are and what their situations are. And it's created a climate where um, most of the guidance is um, bad news for, for governments and it's delayed or it's not provided at all. And, and when it does come, it's the worst news. Um, tribal development is also a relatively new niche area for staff and even the best intention efforts can create unintended um, negative consequences simply because they don't understand the complex issues that tribes um, face and made even more complex by the energy sector. Additionally, there are concerns about the lack of being able to get projects off the ground for a variety of reasons before some of these credits can even be renewed. This is only more compounded by tribes having uh, to wait for additional guidance and rules without also having these deadlines pushed back. So in order to uphold treaty obligations and maintain the government-to-government -government relationship, in addition to uh, Congress's intent, the IRS needs to provide guidance that recognizes the tax-free status of tribal eligible businesses and entities. This is especially crucial for tribal energy development, where partnerships and corporate structure can make or break the viability of a given energy project. The question needs to be answered now, as the uncertainty surrounding the IRA tax credits and tribal businesses um, tax statuses forces far too many of the tribal energy projects into a holding pattern. And so business developers and capital is being held up simply because this um, status is not being answered. And tribes have been, quite frankly, waiting for this guidance for 30 years. And um, we can't wait any longer. Um, it's not fair, and it's causing for us to be uh, delayed in our project development. Thank you. And I'm just learning about this over the last couple of days, but it seems to me that the law is clear. Uh, Indian tribes and Alaska Native corporations are uh, eligible for um, these energy projects. I understand there's a kind of long-standing policy dispute about the tax-exempt nature of tribes, but con on this particular more narrow question, Congress has spoken, and the IRS requiring a tribe to like form an S-corp or do something that was not contemplated in IIJ or IRA is outside of the, you know, the statute. And so th there's a separate question about the tax exempt nature of tribes generally. I, I just think, um, you know, individuals can have their view, but once Congress has spoken, then the discretion is not there to say, well, all the same, we'd like you to you know, form this new entity. And I think that's particularly problematic to Senator Lujan's point. Small tribes can't lawyer up and form a new entity and then just to apply, right? Right. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much for that. Um, and, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yes, it just puts an undue hardship on tribes and it's an unfair and it makes the um, playing field not equal to what states are on. And, and that's not fair for business or development in Indian country. Thank you very much. Uh, Ch Chairman uh, Erickson, uh, your tribe applied for and received DOE grants to address uh, grid resilience uh, uh, in your communities. Um, I'm interested in, in how it went, um, if you have any lessons learned for the committee or for, or for other tribal organizations. Um, may everyone hear me? All right. Uh, halt and chase squeeze. We saw we Hello, good day. My name is Jared Michael Erickson. I'm the chairman for the Colville tribe. Um, 
I'm going to probably answer that and a lot of other questions because I don't know if I'll get, how much time we'll get to speak again. So just a little background on the Colville tribes. We are 12 different tribes. So I want to make sure everyone's aware of that. I know we're a confederation. Um, we all have unique histories to all of our tribes. Um, we have about 39 million acres of our traditional territories and a 1.4 million acre reservation, which is the biggest in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we stretch all the way from Oregon into Idaho, Washington State, and now we have our rights back. Um, we were declared extinct with our Sinaiks, and we won the, our case in the Supreme Court of Canada, so we have rights in Canada as well. Um, with the microgrids, we've had a lot of work we've been doing with our government center. Obviously, for governmental services, we're trying to look on how we can uh, utilize um, solar, battery storage, um, that, and also for our health facilities on the reservation. Um, one thing I want to make clear pretty clear and I think it's been a kind of a resounding thing that I've heard here today is energy has never been favorable to Indian country no matter if it's this money we're getting now if it's the resources taken um, we have the two biggest hydro uh, facilities in the country um, one being the biggest producer of energy in the country of Grand Coulee Dam on our reservation both facilities are on our reservation um, there's a lot of issues there's no there's no real clean energy I don't make people clear about that either right there's one it's you're taking one resource from another area and converting to something else solar takes uh, minerals excavated from wherever that might be and it's all native land right and so um, hydropower we've had the impacts recently we just signed an agreement with BPA the P2IP agreement to get salmon back so we've had we've been without salmon for 80 years in the upper Columbia uh, and other tribes have been without for 100 years above us and so all these energy projects are great but the, none, there's really no clean energy right they all reduce carbon which is which what the ultimate goal is but there's always impact somewhere else that needs to always be looked at and thought about when we're going on these because we always in our traditional territories we're always running into issues where there's these projects these big solar projects but they're not looking at how they impact our cultural resources our wildlife i'm a wildlife biologist as far as on council so i think about wildlife first and we have a lot of sensitive species these always impact so those are things to be thought about when you we, um, do these projects um, we give, yeah, we got about a $4.7 million grant from DOE, and so far it's been in the planning stages. We've been working with local, a couple of local uh, utilities, one in Grant County. Um, we're looking at actually how we can, we're doing battery storage, and with uh, some of the commerce money, I believe we're doing EV chargers and solar down at one of our, uh, our gas stations. We're also looking at how we become, they have an issue with the outages down there as well, and they're actually the lowest in the country, I believe, for uh, what their uh, rate payers pay. And so we're looking at how we can have outages in a certain area of theirs that are close to our, where our gas station is. So we're looking at how we can be, when they go off grid on their system, how we can, they can utilize our, our power and our battery storage um, to help them offset um, any outages they may have. But on the reservation, we've been really impacted with fire uh, since 2015. We've had half our reservation burn. Again, our reservation is 1.4 million acres. We have close to 700,000 acres of our reservation burn. A lot of the infrastructure during that time has, uh, has burned as well. And we lost... 70 or 80 homes in one fire and we lost had one fatality so we've had a lot since 2015 our reservation burn we're looking at grid resiliency i know that was part of the question part of the funding we're getting towards we have a lot of issues with uh, um, um downfall from wind we and then a lot of these fires right there's a lot of these uh uh standing timber that's burned and now that we're getting a lot of issues with those the those falling on our power lines so we're looking at grid resilience good grid resiliency and part of that is looking at how you can put infrastructure infrastructure underground one to create so the power poles aren't always being burned and two we have these downfall wind events that we don't have the um our outages because in our um in inch limb district we have about 20 out outages a year and my side of the reservation we have like four to six so we're, we're running into a lot of those issues that we're trying to, how we can be more resilient for our health facilities, for them to stay online, our local government services, then our members not being impacted as well when all these outages happen. Um, we have our own utility we stood up in 2015. We're still working on the ins and outs of that. Or there's going to take some more money. It might be even travel funding. How Because we, we have to have some substations uh, associated with that that we got to build to build out and create our own utility to become more energy sovereign. Again, it's it's... It's sad when we have our elders paying $600 a month in the winter when we have Grand Coulee Dam sitting right on our reservation and have some of the highest power rates in the state in our, in our area. So, and then you go across the river, I can throw a rock across the river and they have the lowest rates in the country. So that's, that's a discrepancy we need to think about how we can work on. Um, especially when, you know, I, again, whether this was said or not, all my elders have always told me we were promised free energy when those dams are built. And here we are still paying the highest rates in the, in the area. So that's a, a big concern that I have. Um, 
I guess I'll just end with that because I know I'm taking more time than probably was allotted to me, but I wanted to get some of his other points across when it was asked. So we're looking at grid resiliency with microgrids, solar, um, but the least impacts and how we can keep our, our membership online for our health facilities, our government services, and just so we're not, obviously we have harsh winters where we're at, so there's impacts in the winter. We have concerns about elders being uh, too cold, obviously. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you and uh, Vice Chair Markowski for holding this important hearing. And to our uh, tribal chairmen that are here, I guess we're in a round table, Is that what, whatever we're calling today, it's a session. Um, I wanted to, first of all, thank Chairman um, Erickson for being here and for what he just expressed Why well, I didn't hear all of it. I pretty much know their story and uh, definitely had a disproportionate impact on energy and energy costs, certainly with various issues he just mentioned. I, I heard him mention um, some issues related to fire and uh, the Colville, I think probably lost $2 billion in timber resources a couple years ago when we had a big fire. Obviously, besides two large power producing hydro systems, they still face high energy costs, which he just mentioned. And in Chileam community in Ferry County, averages 20 unplanned outages a year when it comes to um, the experiences that these communities have. So I definitely want to use both the uh, infrastructure bill and the IRA bill to help us build capacity in Indian country and to build out that grid in a much more smart, resilient, sophisticated way. Um, I know that we had originally put, this isn't, this is, doesn't quite, I think, touch your land, but the Loop Loop Highway where we just put huge communication system in and then it all burned up and then we had to do it again. So these are challenges we're gonna face in uh, this part of the country, so I know that Colville applied and received a Department of Energy Resiliency Grant of $10 million. Um, but Mr. Chairman, I wanted to make sure I got this right, because as we deal with these issues in the Commerce Committee, particularly with NOAA, we want to make sure that we're getting tribal consultation right. First of all, first and foremost, the government-to-government -government communication about the resources in these accounts and the consideration with uh, Indian country. So are we, are, are you seeing the kind of, uh, tribal consultation that these bills imagined, or do we have more work to do? I would say it depends on the agency. Um, the, uh, the consultation and meaningful consultation are two different things, right? Actually taking input and, and implementing that into what you're gonna be doing, the project moving forward are two different things. So meaningful consultation, I'd say no, we're missing the mark. Uh, consultation, I guess they're checking the box. If you wanna call that consultation, they're doing that. I mean, but, um, the state's better at it. They're not perfect either. They're still work. We're working on better, full, better, meaningful consultation, but we're still not quite there yet. So, um, and like I said, energy isn't very friendly to Indian country and never has been in my experience. So, um, it's it's missing the mark. On that point, you were successful in getting a grant. Um, um, how can that process be improved? And what do you think we need to do in improving wildfire resiliency in the area? How oh, can be improved? Um, so we have some that we can share with your staff and how we can uh, look towards that. Actually, like I, I mentioned meaningful consultation, but as far as fire resiliency, I did speak a little bit in my when you're coming in, but looking at uh, with wildfires, how can we, what infrastructure can we actually put underground, right, that isn't impacted? Um, there's a bigger cost associated with that, but it, overall it'll save you in the long run of having to replace these power poles all the time. The outages you'll get associated with, you know, in the winter for us is the worst time when our elders are, like, luckily most everyone has wood stoves where we're from, because if you don't, you're, you're gonna freeze to death. So um, we do get some negative 30 degree days when it gets really cold. So it's, it's a safety concern for one, for our membership, but, uh, um, yeah, looking at infrastructure, how we can improve that. I mean, you can put metal poles in, but there's a bigger cost associated with that. So it's either look at that or you look at putting uh, infrastructure underground would be one thing to help with resiliency. And did you get a broadband grant from TIA as yes, well? Yes, we got a, about almost a $50 million broadband grant. And so we are implementing that currently and we put in for phase two for NTIA. And so yeah, same, everyone, everyone's same. Everyone's head nodding behind you, so I use yeah. the right acronym. Well, same concerns, right? We want to make sure that we're getting a smart, resilient, investment there and being mindful of the large amount of 
timber holdings that you have and figuring out what's the best strategy for delivering that service. Can I add, uh, yes. add one more thing to that? So when we had the Cold Springs fire, we had, we had one fatality, which is actually an infant. Um, that in, they were non-tribal, but regardless, that's not important to us. It's important is whoever lives on our reservation is safe, right? And so with this broadband, we're hoping that can help with resiliency. How do we create more resilient with the infrastructure funding and this DOE funding to, so because there was a two-day window where the, every, all the communication went out over there. So no one had, they were having to go door to door when this fire was going 50 mile an hour winds are pushing this fire across the plateau. And so that puts our own, our own safety people in harm's way to make sure other people are safe to get out of their homes when those warnings stopped going out, there was no cell service, nothing going out. So um, the, we appreciate these grants and um, for uh, the broadband funding, but also for the energy funding, how to create a better resilient grid so that this doesn't happen and we don't have a loss of life. Well, I think the chairman knows his own uh, tragedy in Hawaii, how devastating this can be and the lack of communication and how fast these fires are moving. And so um, just appreciate um, your your thoughts on that and uh, appreciate you being here today to talk about um, how we move forward effectively and give more opportunities. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Kanayopuni had a comment. Yes, thank you. Um, and I really appreciate the conversation. Um, so one of the things that you had asked about around barriers I wanted to come back to is, is one of them is when Native Hawaiian and tribal organizations have to work through government agencies to access federal funds rather than being a trusted partner in solving issues in our own communities, which makes us then subject to their, the agency's potential and potentially unintended inefficiencies, whether it's being short staffed, working with sometimes outdated systems, procedures that haven't been updated to reflect more recent technologies and times, all of that can be a bar barrier, whereas working directly with us is uh, a faster route to creating the change we need. This we've learned through, for example, the COVID pandemic, when we had to do things like stand up hotels to for people to convalesce because they were living in you know, too crowded conditions and they needed to keep people safe. We had to front the money as a, as a Hawaiian organization, front the money for the government until they figured out how to get it to us. And so things like that, where we want to be the trusted partner and can be to solve issues. The, and and that, you know, that's an undue burden on small organizations uh, to have that hardship um, that would otherwise be completely dedicated to developing and implementing very innovative solutions. Thank you for that time. Thank you very much. and. Um, uh, look, uh, let this be the beginning of a longer term dialogue um, with all of the participants, but also across Indian country and, and native communities in Hawaii and Alaska. Um, we want to track this, and I think there is a tendency for, you know, that's why, that's why we, we, we structured this in the way that we did, where members were not and testifiers were not limited to five minutes because the thing about a five minute limit is it becomes the, both the minimum and the maximum that you talk. And so I wanna have a real dialogue. I wanna track these issues. I wanna know that we are helping the Biden administration to implement all this. I, I was struck by, and I'll, I'll never forget this, um, uh, and, and Senator Cantwell was in the, was in the Oval Office as well. Um, various chair, uh, chairs of various committees were, were with uh, the President of the United States. And he came up to me after um, we had a long conversation about what we were going to try to accomplish together. And he said, you know, Danny Noy was my best friend. And I want you to know that I will always have the back of Native Hawaiians. And he said that to me privately. Um, and he cares about Native communities in a way that I think is historically unusual. It's not that other politicians and leaders haven't cared or expressed that they care, but it's the first administration that's really put their money where their mouth is. Um, this is real. And, um, and so now that we've done all these great things, it has to work. And you are the leaders that are gonna tell us whether or not it's working. And I get that it's a little bit fraught for you to always to come sort of crying to us if something goes sideways. But on the other hand, um, it is our obligation to make sure that the law that we pass, that the, that the money that we provided actually reaches the communities that we intended to help, that with which we have a, tr a trust obligation and a treaty obligation. Um, and so please don't be shy, and not just to the participants, but to anyone who's listening, 
Um, we got to track implementation because strategy is execution at this point, and um, and we've got to get this done uh, on behalf of Native people across uh, the United States. So this concludes our session, but this does not conclude um, this dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you.